Let me return to the general problem of language and its power for ill as well as good. Human children have an awful lot to learn as they grow up. Language is a magnificent tool for learning. It enables us to cram in a few years the best of the wisdom of centuries. No doubt that's why children are so receptive when they're young. Children of a certain age believe whatever they're told. Father Christmas and tooth fairies are harmless enough. But a mind that's capable of believing in fairies is also a mind that's vulnerable to all manner of other stuff. Anybody who heard my first lecture may remember this picture of the distribution of the spoof slide, really, showing a map of the world in which people believed in different ideas, like different theories of the dinosaurs, different, different areas. And the point was to say how absurd it would be if science really worked like that if what you believed about the world or the universe depended upon where you happened to be brought up. And I won't repeat the, the details of that. But do take the lesson seriously. Look at your own beliefs about the world, about life, beliefs about the universe. Do you believe them because you have some reason to believe them? Or do you believe them simply because of where you were born? Would your beliefs about the universe fit comfortably on a map of the world like that? If so, be intensely suspicious of them. If only because the facts about the universe can hardly be different in different countries of the world. Now to our third double-edged sword, technology. Gadgets like these telescope, microscopes and so on are immensely powerful. It's through them that we shall comprehend the universe if we ever do. So what's their downside? What's wrong with them? Obviously, the first thing we think of when we think of bad effects of technology is hydrogen bombs and all the other ghastly inventions of destruction. And that goes without saying. That's the most important effect. But I'm talking about something less obvious, an effect on the mind, quite an interesting effect, which I believe has held up our species' mental growing up. And it's this. We're so used to seeing complicated, elegant, working things that humans have designed that we naturally tend to think that all complicated, elegant, working things must have been designed. In an earlier lecture, I made a distinction between designed and designoid objects. And designed objects are things like telescopes and microscopes that really have been designed by somebody. Designoid objects are things like eyes, which look as though they've been designed and work in often very much the same way, but haven't. But have arisen by an entirely different process, namely evolution by natural selection, Darwin's theory of how things came about. Now, unlike, say, Einstein's general theory of relativity, evolution by natural selection is really a very simple idea. Anybody can grasp it. But in past centuries, nobody grasped it. Not the cleverest people in the world, not Aristotle, not any of the great philosophers, no great mathematician. Nobody got this simple idea until the middle of the 19th century when a couple of naturalists Darwin and Wallace got it. Why did it take so long? There could be a number of reasons, but the one I'm talking about now is this. I suspect it may have been partly the distracting effects of technology. Precisely because we were so used to seeing things that we had made, that engineers had made, things like telescopes, microscopes, ordinary little carpenter's tools and things, we got the idea, children grew up with the idea, that everything had to have a purpose. But now we can see human purpose for what it is. It is a product of brains, and brains are a product of evolution. Purpose has evolved like anything else. For millions of years, 3,000 million years, life forms grew up on this planet that were very designoid, that looked designed, but did not have the concept of design themselves. Finally, one species, ours, grew up that was capable of designing things deliberately, was capable of having purposes. Purpose itself has arisen in the universe, has grown up in the universe recently. But purpose itself, now that it has arisen in human brains, has the potential to be yet another of those software innovations that is capable of taking off into a progressive self-feeding spiral. 
especially when teams of humans share the same purpose. This is a picture of the lunar lander of NASA about to land on the moon. A magnificent example of what groups of human minds can do when they get together with a common purpose. Once the team purpose of standing on the moon had been announced by an American president, it was achieved in less than a decade. A similar group purpose of completely mapping the human genome has recently been agreed and it too will be achieved. Science itself, the understanding of the universe in which we've woken up, is another group purpose with almost limitless potential. We can get outside the universe. I mean in the sense of putting a model of the universe inside our skulls. We've seen that whenever we perceive anything, we're putting a model of it inside our skulls. Our model of the universe will be inside our skulls in a similar way to a virtual reality model in a computer. Now we have a final virtual, virtual reality model and I think we have somebody already trained up to do this. It's Alistair, isn't it? Come along, Alistair. Um, now to begin with, he can fly us around under his own control. So we can go wherever he wants to go. And it's quite a difficult operation. We're now flying around this virtual model, which is in a computer. And there's a picture outside a door. And some of you may recognize what that picture is. Now we're moving away from it again. Remember, we're in a model, in a computer. Now we're going to go, I think, through that door. In we go, burst through the door. Where are we? Lo and behold, we are in the Royal Institution Lecture Theatre. That is a model of the Institution Lecture Theatre in the computer. There's this lecturer's dais. There's the exit there. There are the blue seats. There's the bit of wall under the gallery. Okay, I think that's enough. We've got the idea. Thanks very much, Alistair. Um, we've got the idea. But once again, we had a model of a world, in this case, a little microcosm, a small world, uh, inside the computer. But our model of the universe will not be a little local model like this one. It will be a far grander undertaking. Building it is a shared enterprise. The model is distributed over the network of brains that are participating. Bits of the model are in books and libraries, pictures, computer databases. As time goes by and our civil civilization grows up more, the model of the universe that we share with one another will get better. It will become progressively more refined and more accurate in its mirroring of reality. And at the same time as we grow up, our shared model will become progressively less superstitious, less small-minded, less parochial. It will lose its remaining ghosts, hobgoblins and spirits. It will be a realistic model, correctly regulated and updated by incoming information from the real world. A powerful model with parts that move relative to one another. A model capable of running on into the future and making accurate predictions of what's going to happen to us and our world. We, perhaps alone in the universe, are capable of finally growing up. Thank you very much.